Hello, uh, my name is Hao Xu uh, from City University of New York. Uh, I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy during this uh, challenging time. Uh, today, I would like to uh, share with you uh, the special session that uh, I co-organized with uh, several professors. And in particular, I want to uh, uh, present uh, our research uh, in the last uh, three months about uh, the role of mechatronics and robotics to combat uh, infectious disease. Uh, there are several online resources that are very useful as the robotics or mechatronics researchers, uh, including the one from uh, Robotics for Infectious uh, Disease Consortium, uh, led by Dr. Uh, Robin Murphy and uh, Texas uh, A&M University. Uh, the second one is um, um, Silicon Valley Robotics. We have organized uh, uh, two kinds of events. Uh, one is uh, like a, a small uh, symposium. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, COVID-19 robots and ours. Uh, myself also compi compiled one play uh, list. Uh, there, are, uh, there are about uh, 120 videos about uh, robotics and uh, mechatronics. Uh, and their role to combat uh, infectious disease. Uh, Dr. Robin Murphy is a pioneer in uh, disaster robotics. She has uh, compiled a very comprehensive taxonomy to classify different types of uh, robots, uh, including uh, six types of robots that uh, have been used uh, um, to reduce uh, uh, disease transmission, um, uh, globally. You can go to this website to check about uh, the details, uh, robotics for infectious disease.org. Uh, today we will focus on a special category, basically medical robots. Uh, I basically uh, like uh, classify the uh, medical robots in the continuum of care to combat uh, infectious disease into uh, six categories, including medical robots uh, for like a disease uh, prevention, uh, medical robots for screening, uh, for example, uh, the robots developed uh, and the Chinese uh, Academy of Science, uh, Lifeline Robotics developed uh, in Denmark, and the blood sampling robot developed uh, at Rutgers University in the United States. The third category of robots uh, are used for diagnosis, including ultrasound-guided uh, robots developed in China and uh, several other countries. And uh, also this robot uh, developed in uh, Zhejiang University in China. Uh, the third one is, uh, 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 is uh, image-guided uh, robotic system for biopsy. It's not widely used uh, during the coronavirus, but I think uh, this could be a very valuable solution uh, to ensure the continuity of work during uh, infectious disease. Um, the next category is the uh, robots for treatment, uh, including uh, robots uh, developed in Canada for intubation. And also the same robot uh, developed in Zhejiang University can also be used uh, to operate uh, uh, FEU monitors and some other uh, applications like uh, uh, drug delivery in hospital setting. So basically it's a versatile uh, platform that can be used for different uh, applications uh, in hospital uh, to improve the quality of work of both patients and also healthcare uh, provider. The next category is basically uh, nursing robots. And uh, basically there are two major categories including those robots that uh, only have mo uh, a mobile base and uh, for telepresence, and also uh, mobile robot, uh, basically uh, those uh, mobile uh, nursing robots, they also have a manipulation capability, uh, including the one developed at the UIUC, uh, Diligent Robotics, and uh, H-Star robots, they're all developed in the United States. Uh, the last category may be uh, a little bit overlooked uh, for people uh, who have a uh, disability either due to coronavirus or pre-existing conditions. 
they certainly can benefit from some robots, in particular, some personal robots uh, to enhance their mobility and the quality of life uh, and the home setting, like uh, this uh, um, lightweight exoskeleton uh, developed in my lab. Uh, today, we want to focus on uh, kind of like a three major category robots, robots for uh, disinfection and also robots for uh, incubation. The third category is the nursing robots. Uh, we have done like a research in the last uh, uh, about three months to understand the uh, uh, state of the art and uh, also limitations of those robots. And uh, I will also briefly cover about uh, this uh, uh, like uh, uh, exoskeleton robot uh, for, uh, for home-based uh, mobility assistance. Uh, let's start with the uh, disinfection robots first. So basically, um, uh, there are several types of like a disinfection methods, uh, including uh, pressurized the spray disinfection, chemical fogging in the productive uh, production area, spray and wipe technique. Uh, the last one is ultraviolet um, disinfection method, and. Uh, um, in terms of disinfection robots, generally it falls into two categories. And uh, before we talk about uh, those robots, I want to highlight that uh, there's no evidence about uh, the effectiveness of auto disinfection. So drones for auto disinfection is not shown to be useful based on this uh, uh, medical journal paper. So the disinfection robots, uh, we will talk primary falls into indoor disinfection, including ultraviolet robots and the chemical-based uh, disinfection robots. Um, uh, those robots, especially the first one, have been vali uh, validated uh, for re reduction of hospital-acquired uh, infection. Uh, so we have found uh, several uh, uh, like uh, types of like uh, ultralight uh, uh, disinfection robots, uh, including uh, this uh, uh, robot, the first one, uh, Danex uh, uh, light strike robot uh, developed uh, in the United States, and the UVD robot developed in the Denmark, and the 3D robot and uh, uh, a Kara robot developed in Ireland. And uh, in terms of those robots, generally, they are, uh, most of them are fairly basic. Uh, basically, um, it's more or less uh, like a disinfection uh, ultraviolet uh, uh, machine on top of a passive uh, wheel, especially the first one, which is very popular. Um, I think uh, this UVD robot is uh, also uh, advanced and also very popular and has been used uh, in many airports and uh, public areas. And basically, it's a very uh, nice uh, robotic system that has a slam navigation capability. Another robot that we uh, want to highlight is this mobile manipulator. Uh, robot developed in the uh, University of Southern uh, California. Uh, this has the manipulation capability, so it can also manipulate uh, move around the objects during the uh, disinfection process, which uh, we think is a very unique capability and it could be uh, very useful. Um, there's another very unique uh, uh, UV light based uh, uh, disinfection robots. So basically it's uh, based on the distributed uh, approach. So most uh, uh, disinfection robots, uh, I mean UV disinfection robots, they're based on the single uh, emitter and uh, typically they need to move this robot around. And for this robot, uh, it's basically developed in the, uh, Illinois, United States. It's a type of swarm robot that uh, is composed of three uh, robotic systems that uh, can be located uh, in the room that uh, to be in disinfected. So it's uh, very efficient uh, for delivery of energy and uh, 
uh, it doesn't need the repositioning and it's basically a one cycle uh, procedure. Uh, so uh, I think this is a very impressive robotic system and uh, we found that it's very, very unique. And, but I think uh, uh, we want to see more evidence about uh, uh, the uh, efficacy and uh, efficiency of this robotic system. Uh, in terms of the second category, the chemical disinfection robots, I think uh, uh, the, the most popular one is developed in the Nanyang University, uh, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. And, uh, uh, and the, we know uh, the UV light disinfection uh, is limited by the light line or sight problem. Uh, so basically the chemical disinfection robot uh, generally doesn't suffer from this limitation. Um, but uh, we can also see uh, the chemical disinfection robot has some kind of limitation because it's primarily used for surface uh, disinfection. And um, this uh, Nanyang Technological University has developed this very unique electrostatic spray-based uh, robot manipulator. It can be operated under teleoperation, has a LiDAR sensor for situation awareness, and a stereo camera for depth sensing. So basically, um, it uses uh, uh, some uh, electrostatic uh, method to charge the particle, and uh, the particle will be attached to the object to be uh, disinfected. So it's a more efficient and more effective way than uh, conventional uh, chemical disinfection robot. The second category robot that we want to talk about uh, are incubation robots. Doctor will tilt your head back slightly and insert the laryngoscope through your mouth and down into your throat, taking special care to avoid contact with your teeth. Using the blade, your doctor will gently raise the epiglottis, which is a flap of tissue protecting your larynx. He or she will then advance the tip of the endotracheal tube into the trachea. Once the endotracheal tube is in the trachea, your doctor will inflate a small balloon surrounding the tube to make sure it remains snugly in place. Your doctor will remove the laryngoscope and tape the tube to So basically, um, this intubation uh, is generally a highly skilled procedure, and uh, this uh, ha has been much more common uh, due to the respiratory impact of COVID-19. And uh, actually, uh, this uh, is a, 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 it's both critically important life-saving procedure, and uh, it must uh, carefully navigate uh, through the patient airway but it's actually a very difficult procedure with high risk of complication. So in general, even for experts uh, in operating room, there are 5% of, uh, of possibility um, it incurs um, uh, complication. And uh, for the out of theater scenario, like an emergency medical technician, emergency room residents or SEU, the complication rate is uh, about 49%. Uh, and you can imagine, uh, this is really high complication rate, and uh, there's a possibility that uh, robotics uh, experts can play a role to make this uh, procedure safer and reduce the complication rate. So uh, I think uh, basically from this uh, uh, like uh, uh, page, you can understand uh, uh, the uh, workflow about the airway management and the trachea tube in the specification. Uh, it includes planning, prepare, PPE doffing, uh, pre-oxygen, and the performing, and also post-intubation uh, procedure. So it's, uh, to, to me, I feel like it's uh, more complicated than it looks like. And also, um, in terms of the actual scenario, basically uh, in the um, like uh, for example, in the negative pressure SEU room, and um, it uh, typically uh, in includes uh, every uh, assistant, uh, every operator, one team leader, and also one runner. 
So I think um, the role of the robotic system uh, can play uh, in the future is uh, potentially either uh, like uh, elevate the effort of the airway assistant or even uh, reduce a number of personnel inside of this room. So it has the potential to reduce the disinfection. Uh, actually, this type of robot have been uh, developed for more than 10 years uh, from the early work uh, in uh, Canada. Uh, they used a commercially available um, manipulator uh, for tele-operated uh, tele intubation. And that's also one uh, portable teleoperation system, um, much more compact, developed in China uh, in 2018. Uh, the third one is basically from um, uh, Columbia University. It's a fairly simple procedure uh, because the standard procedure is only provide the video uh, feedback. And for their system, they placed uh, a false sensing, uh, like a, a resistors, a very common uh, false sensor on top of this uh, intubation tube. So uh, the, uh, the operator can get both visual feedback and also haptic feedback. So this is a very simple, but a pretty effective solution. Uh, the most recent development in this area is from uh, ETH Zwick, and the researchers developed uh, this uh, steerable uh, catheter uh, on top of this uh, intubation uh, robot. Also, they provided uh, some like uh, software to uh, provide uh, anatomical segmentation, so it's easier to navigate uh, inside the human uh, airway. Uh, there are several uh, limitations. First, uh, uh, all systems still require front-end assistance. Uh, still, basically, need uh, uh, the regular number of personnel to operate, and also. Um, most systems, I think they are not uh, uh, general enough to account for all patient variation and also not able to handle motion uncertainty of patients. I think all these robots are not uh, uh, well tested uh, in hum through human trials. And another limitation is um, uh, other non-patient dependent problems may uh, inhibit a success for example, a vomiting, uh, presence of foreign objects. So there are many uh, like uh, unexpected uh, events during the practical deployment of those robots. Uh, the third type of robot that we want to talk is a nursing robot. Um, this uh, has been highly demanded during COVID-19. And based on uh, Professor Chris Hauser, the interview and HV spectrum, he defined five primary factions, including communication, mobility, measurement, general manipulation, and the two use. Uh, basically, there are two major categories of those robots. One type is basically, it uh, primarily provides mobility, uh, communication, and measurement. And basically, those, like, uh, those two robots uh, that doesn't uh, involve uh, manipulation. Uh, those three robots represent uh, a mobile, mobile manipulator and uh, it's basically recognized uh, that uh, manipulation is the major bottleneck. Uh, autonomous mobile manipulation for multi-purpose tasks in semi-structured environment or even unstructured environment is very difficult. So uh, imagine uh, those robots needed to either assist uh, nurse, nurses to do precision tasks. It requires a high level of dexterity by manual manipulation, also some power tasks, and uh, then requires high forces. And uh, those problems are not well defined and also not well thought uh, in the robotics community. And it has been very challenging to transfer human uh, versatility to robots, right? So for example, this like uh, our grasp and the precision grasp could be easily achieved by a human, but still very difficult uh, uh, for robotic systems. 
So I think uh, both from uh, the robot design uh, to uh, sensor perception to control, there are tremendous uh, challenges and opportunities in this domain. Um, like uh, in the last few years, quasi-direct drive actuation is a very viable solution to improve uh, the performance of human-robot interaction, either we call it a soft interaction or compliant in interaction. This, has, uh, this uh, uh, novel actuation started from MIT for like robots. And uh, in the last uh, uh, two years, uh, my lab and also UC Berkeley have developed uh, um, uh, robotic exoskeleton and uh, uh, upper limb uh, humanoid robots uh, using quasi-direct drive uh, actuation. Uh, in terms of physical uh, robot interaction, uh, and uh, this actuation can significantly uh, improve uh, compliance, interaction benefits, and also efficiency uh, in comparison with the conventional um, uh, transmission and uh, the series elastic actuator based uh, actuation. So we think uh, this uh, uh, quasi-direct drive actuation and basically high torque density motor in combination with the low gear ratio transmission can uh, significantly improve this uh, uh, interaction performance. So we envision that um, those um, actuation methods can be used uh, uh, for like uh, uh, nursing robots, uh, including the robotic hands and the robotic arm, like this uh, UC Berkeley robot. And uh, another trend uh, in robotic uh, manipulation is uh, uh, multimodal uh, grasping. Like this paper from uh, MIT, uh, they presented a multiplexed uh, manipulation. Basically, it's a versatile multimodal grasping method uh, while a hybrid uh, soft gripper. Basically, uh, this robot combines both uh, uh, suction cups uh, on tip of this uh, um, soft gripper and the soft uh, gripper of this parallel draw. And uh, they can multiplex uh, uh, operation, the manipulation, uh, instead of uh, operation individually. And uh, they showed the integration of suction uh, cup with the soft uh, gripper um, can uh, improve the manipulation so basically 14% of the objects could only be grasped using a combination of these two models. However, um, it also recognized that 88% uh, of the objects were successfully grasped. So basically those uh, heavy objects and also some objects uh, with uh, some unique geometry cannot be uh, grasped with uh, this uh, multimodal grasping uh, method. Uh, in the softer robots um, uh, research community, um, there's also one type of multimodal grasping. For example, this uh, octopus inspired design that combines both uh, uh, bending uh, gripper and the suction cup in a distributed manner. As you can see uh, the figure on the right here, and it's able to gra uh, grasp a flat, curved, smooth, and the rough items and uh, ranging um, from five millimeter diameter to uh, 750 millimeter diameter. And uh, the uh, grasping capability is up to uh, 27 Newton, which has a very imp impressive performance. Uh, in, in our recent work in collaboration with Professor uh, Jie Yin at the North Carolina State University, we developed a high force soft gripper with stiffness modulation capability. So basically, um, uh, as you can see, uh, that uh, this gripper can uh, grasp uh, fairly heavy objects up to 11.4 uh, kilograms. And another nice feature is that uh, uh, by uh, using uh, electric motor uh, to changing the pretension of the spring, uh, we can change the stiffness uh, of the uh, uh, grasping. So basically, uh, the robot can be uh, dynamically uh, changed uh, to control its stiffness to grasp some like a fragile objects 
or some like a uh, non-fragile uh, objects. So this, uh, uh, we think of this uh, like a uh, uh, high force soft gripper could be a very unique uh, um, uh, system to uh, improve physical human robot interaction um, for uh, many robots, in, uh, like the nursing robots, uh, to manipulate uh, uh, many different kinds of uh, objects. In particular, uh, soft robots are generally very, uh, have a very low cost, and so it's very uh, much more affordable than conventional uh, grippers. Uh, in my lab, uh, we also developed uh, this uh, uh, like a uh, um, uh, lightweight personal exoskeleton, and uh, we want to share this video. Uh, then it can be used uh, in home uh, settings to improve independence of people with disabilities. We have invented a hybrid exoskeleton that is softer, powerful, and smart to help patients to regain mobility. Our robot combines the advantages of rigid exoskeletons and soft exosuits. Motors deliver power through soft cables to variable structures to assist both flexion and extension motion. This is the first exoskeleton that is ultra lightweight with near zero resistance to human motion. Thanks to quasi direct drive actuation that use high torque motors with small ratio gears. The variable part is customizable using 3D scanning and 3D printed carbon fiber. Therefore, the robot fits the user very well and it can be worn and clothing. Besides the adult exoskeleton, we also invented a pediatric version, which is purely textile based and mimics the quad muscle. The raw material cost is under $50. Our medical center is the clinical collaborator with Dr. Sue's lab. Soft EMG sensor technology is a human machine interface that monitors the user physiology and varies the power assistance by maximizing the use of the residual or remaining function. Our group plans to conduct the safety and efficacy studies to investigate the usefulness of this technology. This new robot offers a suite of important enabling technologies from sensors and actuators to AI for a variety of patients with lower limb paralysis. The most promising aspects about this innovation is not only the technology itself, but the translational value, the potential for affordability, and the way that the device will encourage user independence. We have so this is another clinical video to demonstrate uh, the functionality of our uh, robots. At the Center for Wearable Exoskeletons here at Tier Memorial Hermann and the University of Texas in Houston, we do a lot of studies using the different lower limb exoskeletons and robots. But many of the robots that we have right now are not practical to be used at home. So we are trying to design a robot that can be put on and taken off easily because it will be lightweight, it will be easy to manipulate. It's something that I predict will be very useful at home for many of our patients. This robot has a camera that will give feedback to the user so that the user will be able to correct the position and avoid hitting something or maybe avoid even falling. This soft exoskeleton also has a soft EMG sensor that can help adjust the resistance to allow a person to vary how much effort is going to be exerted this is not a device that will be produced by roboticists and clinicians that we will suggest to the end users. It's the other way around. The center of this really are the end users. When I put this on, it actually helped me. I felt that I had more stability, it helped my balance, and my gait kind of went very natural. I felt very comfortable in the sense of, wow, this is going to be my friend. I love it. It took about, you know, a minute because it's pretty easy. I'm walking a lot lighter. It's very low profile. I don't hear a noise when I'm walking. Every day use, this is perfect. They have to tell us what they need. They have to tell us what they want so that when we finalize the uh, soft exoskeleton, it is something that will be useful, meaningful, something that will help them in their recovery and their activities of daily living. At 
the center. So basically, uh, some technical messages and uh, robots can play an important role to mitigate the risk of infectious disease transmission. And uh, however, it needs more research efforts and evaluation to develop a reliable robots for rapid deployment. And the new actuation methods like uh, quasi-direct drive actuation and the stopped robots can uh, improve performance of hu physical human robot in action. And lastly, personal variable robots can improve quality of life for people with disabilities during pandemic. Finally, I would like to uh, acknowledge my postdoc, uh, Antonio uh, Di Lalo, who helped me to make this slide. Uh, finally, I want to uh, thank you for attending this special session, and uh, I wish you uh, uh, stay safe and healthy um, uh, uh, every day.